Hello, seeing some folks continue to join us. Welcome in. Hello, everybody. Going to give more folks a chance to log on before we officially kick off. You can see the number keep growing. Very exciting to see. Uh, hello, thank you all so much for joining us for today's conversation. Humility, a humble anarchistic approach, a conversation with Ari Weinswag and John U. Bacon. My name is Joni Hales. I'm a trainer here at Zing Train. I'm going to be your host of sorts today, along with my colleague, Emily Sandilands. She is our community builder and you're gonna see her in a little bit. We are coming to you live from all over Ann Arbor, Michigan, but we would love to hear where you're tuning in from. If you would open up the chat and feel free to drop, drop your location in there, we'd love to see where everyone's at today. To give you some very basic logistical details as we begin, we're gonna to plan to hear from Ari and John for about 40, 45 minutes, and then leave some time at the end for Q&A. Feel free to submit any questions you might have throughout today's webinar by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll do our very best to get to as many questions as we can today, but should we not answer your question, we'll be sure to get back to you with answers in the days to come. We are going to be recording this conversation and we're gonna be sending out the recording in the next day or two, so be sure to look out for that in your inbox sometime soon. Uh, kind of talking about this topic of humility, I think it feels particularly timely to talk about humility in our country. Uh, in a New York Times article last week, there was a senator from Missouri who was quoted saying, the absence of humility can poison any chance for a collaborative approach. I had to read that over a few times to really let it sink in, but the absence of humility can poison any chance for a collaborative approach. And when I think of that, I think, isn't that what we all want? We all want a collaborative approach to, to everything, I think. Uh, we want a collaborative culture. We want a place where collaboration brings the best outcomes. I really believe collaboration does bring the best outcome. So I'm really excited to introduce two folks who I think are particularly primed to talk about humility. John U. Bacon, a teacher and a New York Times bestselling author of 11 books on sports, health, business, and history. His upcoming book, Let Them Lead, Unexpected Lessons from America's Worst High School Hockey Team is going to be released in September of next year. Uh, and of course we have Ari, one of the co-founders of Zingerman's. Uh, he just released his latest pamphlet, All on Humility. It's why you are all here. I think Ari's insights and lessons on why having humility matters, how it impacts our lives and our work and how we live it in our daily work at Zingerman's, it certainly speaks to me. And I'm really excited to hear John and Ari's conversation and to get to share in this experience with all of you. With all of that said, I'm going to happily turn things over to John and Ari. All right. Good morning, Ari. Good morning, Joni. Thank you for that. Uh, Ari speaks to us on the top of Mount Everest this morning, as you can yeah. see. So how's the was, sun there? Uh, it's awesome, man. It, was, uh, it took a little while to get up here, but uh, as it will. Thanks, thanks to your coaching. <laughs> We Let's made dive it. Right and, in, and and the coffee's very good up here. Hey, I did not know that about Mount Everest. So well, high high altitude coffee always, you know, <laughs> better. Man with no oxygen up there. Very well done. So, uh, the topic is, of course, humility, a humble anarchistic inquiry from Ari Weinzig, of course. Uh, Forty page pamphlet, as he calls it. But trust me, this thing's got a lot of meat on it. Ari, my plan, I admit, was to buzz through this thing real simply. I've got two deadlines going right now and so on, but damn it, I kept on digging in, digging in, digging in. You can see all the tags here. Uh, amazingly good stuff from a wide variety of perspectives from Navy ROTC, of course, to Navy SEALs, to uh, psychologists from Germany, you name it, uh, you got it all on here. It's really cool, Japanese masters, whatnot. Um, from the start, this was inspired by a request not too long ago for you to speak on the topic of humility, not your idea. And that, of yeah. course, immediately raised a lot of questions as to whether or not one can humbly do this. Yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, well, yes, the story's in the pamphlet, but uh, this is not a subject that I really ever paid a whole lot of attention to. I got asked by Jamie Vanderbrook, who's a wonderful human being who used to work for us, now works for U of M Library System. Uh, if I would speak at a little symposium they were putting on the following fall, this was, I, I guess, two and a half years ago, maybe, uh, in the spring. And uh, 
she's great. Her husband, Isaac, still works for us. He's great. And I really, my initial thought when she asked was like, I really don't know anything about humility. Uh, I mean, clearly I knew the word. Clearly I knew it's a good thing, but really beyond, and I had some vague sense of what it was, but beyond that, I probably couldn't have strung together three sentences to really tell you anything about it. Uh, but Jamie's so nice and I just, I felt bad and Isaac's so great. So I just I went ahead and said yes, which of course, as you know, then triggers, you have to do all the work to figure out, or you, if you don't want to totally embarrass yourself, you need to do all the work to figure out what you're going to say. And that's really where things got going uh, for me. So uh, I started to research it and I started to learn about it. And as proven true with hope and beliefs and so many other things, the more I researched it, the more relevant I realized it was. And the more important I realized it was to the health of our organization, to the health of really every relationship I have. And uh, right now we're being shown uh, demonstrably daily uh, to the health of a community or a country or the world. So it's, it's proven quite interesting and enlightening. I, I would hardly say I'm an expert, but I, I, I know a lot more now than I did when she asked me. It's kind of a catch point too, right? You really can't claim it, to be an expert on humility, can you? No, it's totally, well, that's the, the, I mean, in the beginning, I told the story when I went in there, I was, I'm always nervous when I'm going to present on something for the first time. Uh, and I had never talked about this subject. Plus I'm, I don't know, more nervous in an academic setting because the questions tend to be more like what's the hole in what you said, not what, you know, the <laughs> stereotyping, but anyway, and, and when you combine that with the fact that it's about humility and it didn't really seem to make sense to me that you could even have get people get up and talk about humility when by definition they were going to be in trouble. And I, I mean, by, from the start, because they were actually talking about a subject that you really probably ought not be saying anything about. And uh, I, I found that little uh, thing from uh, the, the, the guy in Pakistan, Shazad Hussein, who said, my uncle was given a medal for humility, but they told him if he wore it, they would take it away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the catch, right? So the yeah. other word here we need to get into inquiry we know about of course but uh anarchistic yeah. you've always claimed yeah. this from the start of course uh i'm sure of our almost 200 viewers here today many are familiar with your work your restaurants of course and coffee chains and whatnot uh but um your right written work many would know that too you've talked about this before but i need to point out when he says he's an anarchist uh your businesses are incredibly well organized with a very yes. high level of discipline uh, are yes. you a crappy anarchist? <laughs> no, that's uh, that's a that's a complete misconception, which just that's shows you the power of beliefs and how stereotypes uh, can be conveyed. And in this one, it's probably less harmful than stereotypes around race or gender, things like that. But it, it's the same stuff. It's completely not accurate. Uh, it's actually the opposite of what's really true. Uh, there was actually a piece on NPR yesterday. Uh, people can look it up, which was, I didn't love it, but it was kind of good, well intended to try to explain to people more about anarchism than what President Trump uh, knows uh, when he references anarchists all the time. But actually, anarchism is all about organization. There's a whole conflict is my obscurity, but there was a whole conference held in 1907 in Amsterdam of, that this was the main topic of the conference was organization. Uh, and, and what really, the, the message is that it's all about organization, just the key is that the people who are being organized are participating in the work of the organization, as opposed to the old model, which is the boss goes somewhere, retreats into the back room and then decides what the, the systems will be and then imposes them from above. So that, that's really the difference, uh, but it's really about, it's a, it's a way of life and a belief system, I guess is what I would say, uh, one of my favorite quotes from an anarchist is Gustav Landauer, the German uh, early 20th century, late 19th century. And he said, we have no political beliefs. We have beliefs against politics. And, and that really helped me understand it's a belief system and a way of life, which is really just starts with how I treat you, how I treat myself and how we manifest our daily existence in the world. Having defined our terms, both humility as well as anarchy, so we're up to speed now. <clears throat> when you dived into this, of course, uh, you found a lot of great writers right away. Uh, mm -hmm. One, the central one seems to be Dr. Edgar Schein, yeah. who appears throughout this book, of course, including the end. But yeah. give us a bit of background on him. He's a 
colleague of Peter Drucker is well known to almost any business reader. Yep. Um, big name, Shine less so, I would say. Uh, yeah. But maybe more, might be the more interesting one. So tell us a bit about him and what you learned from him. Yes. Yeah, so he, I've actually never met him in person. We've emailed a few times over the years, and I tell the story in here of emailing him while I was working on this. But I, I came to know him. Uh, well, he was born in, for context, in 1928. Uh, but I really didn't know a whole lot about his life. I came to know his work in the mid nineties. Uh, there was an essay that he wrote about uh, stages of organizational development in which he took, I thought a very, very interesting uh, frame that really opened my mind and helped me to see some of the struggles that I was having in our leadership work and at the deli at that time and then Zingerman's uh, in, in a new light. So what he pointed out in that article is that People in, in the leadership field of study are always arguing over what's the right style and what's the wrong style and going back and forth. And what he said is, you're asking the wrong question. He said the right question is not what's the right style, it's what's the right style for the stage of development at which the organization is at, because he pointed out, which totally made sense, as the organization develops, you need different stages of, of, of leadership, different styles of leadership, I mean, in order to be well suited to it. So John, your son is how old? Five. Five. So the way you parent him now is probably already radically different than how you parented him when he was one. Equally ineffective too, by the way. <laughs> well, that, yeah. <laughs> and how you parent him at 15 is going to be radically different again, at 25 radically different again. And so it's not that one of those styles of parenting is right or wrong. It's just that you need to match the style to the age and stage at which the child, or in our case, the organization is at. So that's really where I got to know him. And he really uh, is generally recognized as sort of one of the first, or if not the first person to really write in depth about organizational culture, which in hindsight requires a good bit of humility because when you go in as an effective anthropologist, you're, you're going in to learn from others, not to impose your own belief system on them, but rather to understand where their theirs came from and what it is. Uh, and then I kept reading more and more of his stuff. And then, as you know, I wrote uh, the essay in part three, uh, which you immediately get the pun on uh, play on words of the Pink Floyd song, Stein on you crazy diamond, uh, which was sort of my cover version of that, uh, of his article and how we applied it at Zingerman's and what it meant to me. And at that time, I happened to be doing Zing Train work. We were at uh, MIT teaching Zing Train at the business school there. And the woman who was the, the head of the administrative arm of the business school uh, said, oh, he, I know Dr. Shine. And I was like, really awesome. Would you connect me? And she did. So I got his email. I sent him a draft. He gave me the thumbs up. Very nice. Uh, that was sort of the end of it. And then when I was working on this, I got out his little book, which is uh, called Humble Inquiry, because it seemed to sum up uh, this approach. I needed to do an inquiry, but I didn't really know much. Uh, and then because it was about humility, humble inquiry seemed really a, a, a perfect uh, place to, uh, to, to enter, the, enter the research and enter my study. And then as the more I learned about him throughout this, the more it resonated. And so I ended up reading his little autobiography, Becoming American. Turned out that his family had moved from his his father was famous for his research on cosmic rays who knew and uh and they had moved uh, after a number of moves in in, in europe uh, to get away from uh the impending nazi uh regime uh they ended up in chicago in 1938 which ironically is where my family lived and uh they his father taught at university of chicago and i was like wow my my grandparents had a laundry in Hyde Park, man. I mean, for all I know, they were like cleaning his suits. I mean, it's not it's not really that far fetched. And it was just interesting when I read his autobiography. So much of his childhood, well, sports and everything was really sort of of my mother's generation. So it was cool. Very cool. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit, based on what you just said by Dr. Shine, um, that it depends on what stage you're, where you are. Of course, my kid's five. When he's 15, it'll be less effective, I'm sure, and 25, let's hope for the best, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, you point out your example here, of course, is very convenient. In 1982, you and Paul Saginaw start Zingerman's with exactly two employees. And how you led that co company, of course, is going to be very different than leading 700 people today, a uh, multitude, you know, a dozen businesses, of course. Um, how has that changed with you from 1982 to the present? Probably several times, probably many ways. What's the biggest difference, you think, looking back at that approach versus your approach today? 
Well, I mean, it's, I don't even know what the biggest one is, but there, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of all different and yet it's all the same, right? I was just reading uh, some stuff from Donna Markova, who's Emma Goldman's great niece, uh, who wrote the forward for part two of the book. And uh, she's got a, a really great quote. I've been doing a lot of work on ecosystems and organizations a lot of people know. And uh, anyway, what she, she pointed out, a tree grows up and down at the same time. Very cool. Right? Yeah. So, so I think if, if one looks at an organization like that, then on the one hand, the, the roots of our core beliefs, which we started with, go deeper and deeper. Commitment to the staff, commitment to quality, commitment to the community, commitment to collaborative work. I mean, those were there informally in, in 1982 when we opened. They're far deeper now, 38 and a half years later than, than when we started. At the same time, we've grown up in many ways. So I had no clue about any of this. I probably will never live down. Uh, leaning on the uh, deli case, probably three, four months. You know, we had worked for this, uh, not large, but larger restaurant group that was, in my mind, at least more corporate. We'll put it in quotes because I don't know that that's really true. But in my head, that's how it seemed. And uh, we were about three, four months into the deli and I leaned on the counter and I was like, God, this is so great. We don't have to write anything down anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but so, in a way, in a way with two employees, it, with two employees, that wasn't, that was not untrue. <laughs> with 700, it's a whole different set of communications and I, shine stages. Yes, this pamphlet is nothing compared to the beliefs book or whatever, but Everybody on this call knows it's 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 absurd, but I guess it's modeling humility by telling you that story. But anyway, uh, the point of this is just his four stages. The first is startup or beginning, which we were going through. The second is what he calls building. This is where you start to delegate tasks out and bring in some uh, similarly minded or people who share beliefs, I would say, in the context of the beliefs book. The third stage he calls uh, mature, but I like to use Yitzhak Gadiz, a different uh, expert in the field. He calls it operating in prime because I think in, in human terms, we will get older and we can't go back. But in the organizational sense, one can stay in prime for a really long time. And I, I the fourth stage is changing. And that's where I actually had placed us as an organization last winter, as I was saying to, to our organization, we're changing. Paul has been slowly pulling back. Maggie at Zing Train has been pulling back. We have our new 2032 vision, which is probably a different talk that we'll do another time. We're rolling out our statement of beliefs. I mean, there's just a lot going on. Uh, and then also our industry had been changing. The food world has been changing and evolving. So we had all that. And I'm like, okay, we're in the changing stage, which is not easy. Well, then the pandemic happened. And if I had any doubt that we were in the changing stage, kind of the, our whole world has been thrown into the changing stage. So his, his four stages have proven very helpful. Different parts of the organization are at different places, which diverse, the most diverse e ecosystems in nature are the healthiest. And we somewhat intentionally created that with this idea of the community of businesses. So we have some at startup, some operating at prime. Good stuff. To be clear too about the term humility, and you're very clear about this, delight, delightfully so. Um, what we are, what we are not talking about. We're not talking about false humility, which drives both of us crazy. I'd yeah. rather to be flat out arrogant and own it than yeah. bring me the false humility, of course. We're not talking about, and you spell this out later on in the book as well. You're not talking about diminishing yourself either, underestimating yeah. yourself, knocking yourself down, and so on. Um, what you are talking about is when you look at it objectively, there's only so much you can do by yourself. And therefore, it breeds what I believe a very holistic uh, humility, if you will, an earned one. Uh, you quote uh, Masanobu Fukuoka. Yeah, he says taking credit for anything is like clapping your hands and then arguing about which hand is making the sound the right or the left. Brilliant. Yeah, you can use that with your hockey team. Oh, I'm stealing it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I got it from him. You don't know. He, he's, it's an amazing book, One Star Revolution. And, and in the spirit of what you just said about learning from everybody, uh, I referenced in the book, uh, I, I, the book recommendation to read Fuku, Fukuoka's book, One Star Revolution, came from a bus boy at the roadhouse, Dylan, who was, I don't know, maybe 18, right? And just reinforced the message that you can learn from everybody. But what, what you just said, it was actually one of my biggest learnings from this. I, I would have thought in my uh, general ignorance about humility that if you, as long as you didn't think too much of yourself, that you were humble. 
right? So if you had a very low self-image, then you must be humble. You might not be doing well, but you must be humble. But actually from studying other people's work who knew a lot more than I did, it became clear that was not the case. So what I would say now, and it's implicit and embedded in the pamphlet is just, it's really treating yourself with dignity while also believing that no one is better than you and no one is worse than you, right? We're all unique and we're all different. So it's not to demean uh, the creative uniqueness of each person, but to understand that we're all essentially on par in our own unique ways. And, and to your point, to, to understand that we're all human, which means we all make mistakes. And it means that we all know stuff that the other people don't know. So the newest employee that we just hired this week knows things I don't know that would help me. And I know stuff that would help he or she, so. Very smart. So that's what we're talking about. Not just minimizing yourself, not saying, oh, shucks. And people get Academy Awards and say, I'm humbled by this award. I, that never made sense to me. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that became clear to me, and it's not a surprise to a lot of people on here, but I realized you, that false humility uh, is manifested quickly in energy. And, and that's really what you're picking up on when you're giving that commentary. Uh, and I, I, this is why faking it as a leader and pretending to be humble isn't really going to cut it because the staff will pick up on the energy in 18 seconds. And to those ends, uh, we've both been, I think, pleasantly surprised where we find this. Um, you talked to, of course, uh, your friend in the Navy ROTC, yep. talked about humility. Yep. Um, the Navy SEAL commander, Jocko Willink. Yep. And the ones who failed are the and the Navy SEALs we're talking about. This is as alpha as you can get, of course. Yep. Uh, the ones who failed, the Navy SEALs, are the ones who failed to listen. And when I tell people, people ask me what I learned most from Bo Schembechler, and no one can believe this. Bo Schembechler was a shockingly good listener. <clears throat> that would not surprise you because you know how leadership works. Now, I don't think Bo is too interested in listening when he's running the off tackle play during practice. That was not open for debate, I don't think. <laughs> They're getting things done. Uh, he was but, not an anarchist. No, he was not an anarchist. That, <laughs> and he'd, he'd be the first to say it. But to a shocking degree, he had an open door policy. Um, Gerald Ford, by the way, the leader of the free world, had to leave a message. Jim Hackett, the backup center on his demo team, gets in there, no problem, no appointment. And as Bo told me one time, it is not my job to speak to the leader of the free world. It is my job to beat Purdue. <laughs> 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 that's a focused individual all right yeah. and Jim Hackett even though he's a backup center on the demo team had more impact on that and therefore had more importance to him as a human being Bo was yeah. a great listener the Navy ROTC guys the Navy SEAL guys they're surprisingly good listeners and that's one thing that you have to have essential to humility is recognizing as you said about your new employee that person that's going to teach you that you don't know all right so it starts with listening correct Yep. And I, I uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's interesting with Bo. I mean, you've told me some of these stories before when we've talked and it just reinforces for me why these are essentially natural laws. Uh, a lot of people on here have read the first essay on 12 natural laws that's in part one of the book, but I have this other list I'm working on, which many of you also know for 12 more and uh, humility is going to be on there because it's just clearly, uh, I, I don't mean you can't get to the top without humility. We know that you can, <laughs> but uh, to create something meaningful, lasting, generative and positive, which is really the work that everybody on here is trying to do, not just to get to the top at all expense of anybody else around you is, is got to include humility. And it's a natural law because it comes up in the military. It comes up in Michigan football. It comes up from Masanobu Fukuoka, a farmer and a poet in Japan. It comes up really everywhere. So I, I think that's without question, that's true. Back to listening. Uh, yes, I, I grew up in a loving family that did many good things for me. But one thing they did that is causing me some challenges is that they uh, we, we grew up cutting each other off and talking over each other. And so in my family, if no one cut you off, it meant they weren't listening. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> okay. So, so you may be with me that you're in recovery, uh, as I referenced in the book, I'm, I'm going to spend the whole rest of my life trying to get better at it. I, I, I think I'm notably better than I was 30 years ago, but I still slip. And like everybody, when we're stressed out, we slip back to the deepest roots in our, in our brain, uh, which go back to our childhood. So 
I'm, I'm always going to be in recovery from it, but I've learned from a lot of other people and, and, and try to be uh, more effective. Uh, it's, a, it's my life project. Uh, yours and mine, pal. So I'm with you. Um, along these lines, uh, myths. You love busting myths, of course, and there are plenty mm -hmm. of myths here to be busted. Yeah. You talked about false humility. And by the way, as far as that goes, um, what I discovered coaching high school hockey, my line to the players every game night was the coaches wear shoes. Whatever happens here tonight, you guys are going to do. And you go around, you know, management by serving water, of course. Um, yeah. If Zingerman's going to work, you can't serve every meal, correct? You can't make every meal. It's not a matter of being falsely humble to point out that you need help. For crying no, out it's life. just the reality. I, I exactly uh, for the e news. Uh, what's today? Tuesday. That'll be out tomorrow. Uh, I've been writing about. Sir, I was writing about servant leadership, right? Which is also uh, one of the many uh, reasons that I realized part of why Jamie Vanderbroek asked me to speak in there is because we're already doing this. I just had, I was unconsciously. I won't say competent in humility, but we were unconsciously competent as an organization. Uh, about teaching humility. We weren't saying humility, but it was embedded and implicit in a lot of the things we do, including servant leadership. Anyway, so I, I was working on this uh, little piece for serv about servant leadership for the e-news. And uh, over the weekend, I was, or Sunday, I guess, I was reading the New York Times. So like two different articles, unrelated, right? So in one article, I see a quote from a well-known leader who's like, the CEO should never carry their own bags. It's, it's, it's demeaning. It makes them so ordinary. And I'm thinking like, wow. Then I turn the page and there's another quote from another guy, a CEO of a healthcare company. And he basically says, I don't really care about the employees or the, com or the community. I'm just here to return value to the shareholders. And I'm like, it's not shocking to me that you still thought that, but that you actually said that on the record for the New York Times. So, you know, I realized like when I was working at it, I've been in embedded in servant leadership, not that I don't screw it up daily, but I've been embedded in it for 30 some years. Like this is just the way that we live and think. So I know I mess up, but when I mess up, I know I messed up. I don't think, oh, that was good that they did. <laughs> and and, and it, re it reminded me, like hit me upside the head when I was reading those quotes, like this is just not the norm, right? And so the humility piece is not the norm. Uh, and the myths that we're talking about really are commonly held beliefs out there. And I, I, I believe they're contributing to the problem. Well, let's knock down three right now on page okay. 17. Uh, leaders are born, not made. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I don't buy it. Uh, this is a common uh, conception out in the world. It's just not true. I mean, I, 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 I have found over and over again that everybody who can learn to lead, uh, it's a skill. It may come more quickly to some than to others. Uh, I, I, because I'm an intuitive and not a statistician, I, I'm not going to give you data, but I'm sure other people can. But I, I have found over and over and over again, the people who uh, others perceive to be, in quotes, natural leaders, when I start to listen and ask them more about their upbringing and their background, pretty much every time their parents were upper level leaders in an organization. They were the, the, the captain of their volleyball team at eight. They were the head of the debate team at 12. You know, so it's just over and over again, what I start to realize is they were learning leadership from the time they were the age of your son, who's learning it right now, because even if he's not participating uh, with you and Christy in the conversation about your book, and I guarantee you he's taking in those lessons, right? And so... By the time he comes, if he comes to work here, if we're lucky, when he's 16 or 17, no joke, he will have 15 years of training in essence and leadership. Whereas like when I started, I had never <laughs> in my intuitive anarchistic sense participated in any organization. And my, my, my mother was a teacher, substitute teacher, and my stepfather was a, was a professor. So they, I really wasn't surrounded by leadership at all. I made it, so I assume other people can do it too. But but I think if people don't understand that it's a lot of hard work. It is hard work. And it's actually... Yeah, and that it's a light it's, project, right? It's, people think it's harder work to go command and control than it is to go laissez-faire. You're talking about it's not laissez-faire. It's harder to develop your own people so they can lead themselves yeah. in an yeah. anarchistic way than yep. it is to just you know, let it all go or to be command and control. It's actually harder. It, it, to me, it's like... Teach your kid how to ride a bike. Two easy ways to do it. One, 
I'm going to hold the bike for you the whole way, or I'll just get on the bike myself because screw you. <laughs> the other one is there's the bike. Good luck. You know, if you scream really loudly, yeah. maybe I'll come. The hard thing to do is the most important thing to do. And that's to get them on the bike, hold the seat, and then know when to let go, knowing they're going to wipe out and letting them wipe out. And that's hard and not scolding them and not making them regret it. Just get on the bike again. Yep. Um, it's a harder approach. It sounds easier, but it actually isn't. And no, so it's definitely not easier. I mean, it's, it's, it's more work, but I, I, I believe that anything great is more work. I mean, so you could have handed in your manuscript for this book months ago and it probably would have been passable, but you're pushing yourself to make it better. And that said, we also know that we're all human and we're all imperfect. So you'll find typos and problems and things that need to be corrected. And as soon as it goes to print, you'll learn seven things you wish you would have put in the book because that's what happens to me. Always. Yeah. But anyway, the key is leaders can learn. I, Peter Kestenbaum, amazing uh, writer, also uh, Dr. Shine's age, so like 91, 92, uh, 93. Uh, he said that the leader's primary responsibility is to develop leaders. I like, I'm going to write that one down. I'm, yeah. uh, folks, I'm typing because I'm stealing stuff from my book. Go ahead. In it's in part three. It's in great. part three. You can find it in there. I'll, I'll send you that quote. Right, you but it. that really helped me because it made me realize that like my job, I might be out there pouring water, which I can't even do in the pandemic. So now it's more running food or busing tables. But it's it's while I'm doing that is to help the other people learn to think like leaders. So if you're to, to your point about the bike, if you're telling them people what to do every five seconds, in some ways, it's less stressful in the moment, but they're not really learning to think in the abstract. And most all of life is thinking in the abstract. There you go. Two more myths we'll knock down. Yeah. Great leaders are never afraid and they have all the answers. Yeah. So I, maybe some leaders out there are never afraid. But uh, as Brene Brown said about something else, she goes, that person might exist, but I've never met them. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was a very good way to say it because I, I can't, I have not surveyed all leaders in the universe to find out. But I, I will say from my own experience, uh, I'm pretty much always afraid. Uh, I, it's not an exaggeration. Sometimes I'm afraid to go to work in the morning. I just take a deep breath and I go. Uh, every time I sit down to write that e-news every week, I'm like, it's going to suck this week. It's going to be terrible. I don't think I can do it. And then I just have taught myself to keep typing and something comes out. So I, I, I believe that fear in a healthy way is normal. Uh, Peter Kestenbaum's main work is actually around helping people understand that anxiety is the state of human existence. The question is, what kind of anxiety do you have? Is it positive the positive anxiety of writing a book like you're going through that you believe in or is it the anxiety of trying to conform to something that you don't believe in and to do work that you really don't want to do so it's not to get rid of the fear it's to understand the fear own the fear and learn to work through it but when we tell people that leaders are fearless and then they feel fear the obvious conclusion is i can't lead or there's something wrong with me the other one, uh, the idea that the best leaders have all the answers. I mean, this is probably one of the biggest issues around humility, right? So we get trained socially that we're supposed to have the answer. And that if we don't have the answer, we're flawed or we're screwing up or we're incompetent or whatever. And uh, one, of the, one of the big learnings for me has been over the decades now is like, no, it's actually, and Paul's really historically was way better at this than me is like, to just say to people, I don't know the answer. What do you think we should do? Because A, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. <laughs> B, they're going to have insight that you don't have. Uh, and, and C, it helps them to learn to think like a leader. So this is our, our visioning process and our bottom line change process. Both of those, a big piece of the work is to be able to send out drafts that you know aren't that good. <laughs> and one of the biggest mistakes that I used to make, and now I hear others in our organization make it's the exact same one, is like they keep working on the draft, working on the draft. I, don't, I just want to tweak it a little more. I'm like, no, try to understand. I learned this the hard way. It's actually better if it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the people who you send it to for input are going to give you feedback that's going to enhance it you'll get a better draft out of it and they're going to feel better and more engaged. And you're complete completing both of these really important pieces of work simultaneously, which is awesome. Uh, an analogy before you sell your house, people want to recarpet it, repaint it and so on. Don't the buyer doesn't like your stuff anyway. There you go. Good stuff. point. <laughs> yeah. 
they're going to redo it anyway. So <laughs> what I say about to writing to writers, of course, let your first draft suck. This is going to anyway. All right. Yeah. Get to the end of it. Yeah. Now you got a thing yeah. that you can make better. Um, so that's the idea there. Yeah. But uh, back to the bravery part, the afraid part. My wife is watching. I cannot recall the cartoon my son was watching, but it popped in my head as you were talking. It's a great line from Paw Patrol or one of these. So Christy, go ahead and text me. Um, before you can be brave, you have to be scared, which kind of makes sense. If you're yeah. whoever's committing bravery, if you're not scared first, then you're an idiot. All right. If yeah. you're, you know, climbing up Mount Everest for the heck of it with no oxygen, you're an idiot. All right. That's not being brave. That's being stupid. Um, so you know, open up your own business. If you're not a little scared, you're probably crazy. Um, yeah. it's scary. It has to be a little yep. scary. And what I tell speakers before they get on the stage, I get butterflies to this day. You do too. And I tell them, you have to have the butterflies. You're not going to run yeah. your fastest or swim your best without the butterflies. You have to have them. But they're your butterflies. Make sure they're flying information and you're cool. All right. You need the energy. Welcome the butterflies. Don't try to repress them because that never works. Suppressing the butterflies yeah. only makes it worse. Yeah. So, no, absolutely. It, and you, you hang around with a lot of well-known athletes. I mean, I guarantee, I guarantee they're, they're all nervous before a game. Yeah. And, and, and probably most of them will tell you when they had a game where they didn't play well, they weren't anxious enough, actually. Great line. Dan Deardorff, Michigan All-American, NFL Hall of Famer on Monday Night Football. He was asked his senior year by the guy getting dressed next to him. He said, man, when do you quit getting nervous before a game? And Deardorff said, before my last one. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So embrace that, people. So. Uh, key point, we're going to throw it over to questions here very shortly. We're doing pretty yep. well here. Uh, a key point later on in the book, humility is not settling mediocrity. You're not yeah. saying we're not that great and that's cool. That's not what humility is. Yep. Elaborate on that, please. Yeah, that's another thing that I wouldn't have been able to answer when I started this this humble inquiry. I mean, I, I really wouldn't have been able to put it in any kind of meaningful context. And one of the things I initially asked myself, well, if you're humble, I mean, how can you kind of go for greatness? Like, it seems like it's, it's inc incongruent, but it actually turns out that's not the case. Uh, and that, that uh, going for greatness actually comes from humility in many ways, if it's grounded, because you're, 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 you're trying to improve and owning that you have these imperfections and owning what in essence is now known widely as continuous improvement, but I would suggest just a natural law of human and organizational existence, which is all healthy, great people and healthy, great organizations are always trying to get better. When I talked to Peter Kestenbaum, he's still working. I just talked to him a couple of weeks ago, what I already said, 93. He's still working on learning new things. Right. And when you quit, you're in trouble. So, yeah. So, I, I think the key, though, is to understand, and I, I've written about this in the beliefs book and other places too. And this is a big piece of the anarchist stuff, actually, going back to that, but is to understand that greatness is a self defined term. When we're trapped in going for in quotes, air quotes, greatness that's socially imposed that's where we're in trouble. We're in trouble because we're out of alignment with what we really want and believe in. And we're, we're out in trouble because uh, we're going after something because somebody else told us in quotes that we should, and that never works. So greatness for some people might mean that they don't work. Greatness for other people means they work a lot. It's, there's not one size fits all. To the contrary, everybody's a unique human being, right? So for some people like you and me, writing a lot is great for other people they don't even want to get anywhere near it and they're both legit it's just learning to be true to ourselves and then pushing ourselves to be great whether it's parenting or writing poetry uh, or just doing yoga whatever it might be it doesn't really matter it just matters that it's important to us and that's another key to humility also it's the ability to define yourself in other words it's not the rat race it's not you know the s p 500 etc 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 it's you have to define it i found the great teams the great organizations and you got a team there of course you define yourselves. I know that yeah. national corporations have been dying to buy you guys out for years. You don't want that. That's not how you measure your success. Yeah. Well, everybody gets to have their own success. And uh, Thelonious Monk, uh, the jazz musician, I just read Robin Kelly's biography of him, uh, which is really good if you like obscure. I, I actually don't listen to a lot of jazz, but I love the, the, the music and I love who he was and learning about that era. And by the way, just for uh, contextual uh, information. So he was born in 1918, 
in uh, eastern North Carolina, uh, I think in the same town that Michael Jordan was born, maybe, but oh, along yeah. that along that coast. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, he was born in 1918, and so uh, in this 500-page book that Robin Kelly wrote about Thelonious Monk, like page I don't know 35, it says a really bad flu pandemic came the next when he was one. But the family already had a lot of other problems. They survived the flu and the other problems were still there or something. So it got like two sentences in a 500 page book. So although right now it's like taking over our lives, if you could just get out another hundred years, this is going to be nothing. Uh, <laughs> all we got to do. <laughs> but anyway, yes, it, it is about to find ourselves. And the reason I got on Thelonious Monk is that there's a great uh, quote from him that's uh, I, it put in part three with, of the book, which is a genius is the man most like himself. Hmm. Right. And so this is one of the reasons I love our visioning process is because it's not about an outside in exercise, which is how it's generally taught. What's the hole in the market? How can you make the most money? Look for the weakness. You know, this is really what do you want to do? Right. And so I, I believe having struggled through this myself and then worked on it with so many other people over the years, we all know in our heart kind of what we pretty much what we want. It's just the other voices are going in there all the time about what we should do, what we shouldn't do. This could go wrong. What about that? What about this? What about that? And we overthink everything. Whereas if we can get back to being true to ourselves, and, and it took me a long time uh, to be able to say that. And even then, I still doubt myself every day. But I think that's really what it's about, to your point. The more we're true to ourselves, the more grounded we are. And I, really, one of the big learnings for me, which uh, is at the end of the pamphlet, was just this realization that when we're in a state of humility or what I came to call humbleness, we're at our most human. And okay. linguistically, I realized the words are very related. Uh, humility is tied to, to, to the earth, to humus. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, the first man in the Bible was Adam. Uh, Adama is earth. You know, in this legendary state of the Bible, man was created from the earth. So it's really when we're grounded in that sense is that we're at our most human because when our ego has taken over and we all struggle with it, when our ego has taken over, it removes us from our natural humanity. If we make ourselves uh, really low, worm-like, incompetent, somebody had mentioned doormat in there, then we're not being human either. We're, we're demeaning ourselves and making ourselves subhuman. There you go. Two. Get the other quote correct about uh, before you can be brave, you have to be scared. It is, in fact, from Pete the Cat, uh, on whom Elvis Costello has occasionally played. He is uh, one groovy dude. He'll put you in a happy mood. He's got a funky style and a cool attitude. There you go. Thank you, Christy, my wife. So, Thanks, Christy. It just reminds you that you can learn from everybody. There you go. It's a cool show. Uh, well, you know, I want to finish this, with this question and turn it over to questions yeah. from the crowd. Can you teach humility? Yeah, so this is another one that I changed my mind about. Uh, I would have instinctively or quickly said that you can't uh, when, we, when, I, when I started this work, but I actually have come to believe that one can. Uh, like teaching anything, the student has to be ready for the teacher to appear. So in the same way that if somebody who works at the deli is not interested in learning how to, whatever, use lean management processes, we can't make them do it. It's not going to work out. So I, I'm not suggesting you can just, uh, let's hope they come up with a vaccine. Uh, this is not gonna be something you just inject humility uh, to somebody intravenously or whatever, and then it's all taken care of. This is really more, it's, it's like teaching any other skill, right? So learning how to do visioning is a skill. I've taught it as many of the Zing Train people have to thousands of people now. Some people go, oh, this is awesome, totally makes sense. Some people are like freaking out. I don't know what to write, I can't, you know, and so, there's going to be a whole range. So there's some people who we hire who already bring humility. Uh, Patrick Lencioni pointed out the value of hiring for that. It's now something on my mind when we do hiring, because I realized when I read his book, Ideal Team Player, it's humble, hungry, and smart are the three things. I referenced it in here. Uh, humility is critical. That said, we can also teach humility. And this is where I realized we were doing so many things in our own organization that we're bringing the idea of humility across to people. When people live them, they're acting in humble ways, whether they intended to or not. If they don't 
get into a humble place, they will not be able to be effective at servant leadership. If they don't get into a humble place, they won't use our bottom line change process because the strong leader who knows everything and is never afraid wants to dominate by just dictating everything to do. And they don't want to go ask a busboy or a baker or, or a new junior bookkeeper what they think we should do. But the system really requires you to do that. So our training compact using consensus, I mean, there's a whole list of, I think, 16 in the pamphlet of ways yeah. I realized in hindsight that we already were doing this work. So I think you absolutely can train it. There's no guarantees people will learn it well, but that's true of how to make sandwiches or how to do marketing or, or anything else. Good stuff. Uh, more questions. That was Susanna Bolana's question, I believe. Uh, open to more questions. Emily, what do you got? Welcome back in here. Actually, Susanna had a great uh, follow-up question to that, which okay. was how. Where is the how for teaching? We can teach it. Do you have any ideas? Well, I, I tried to list the ways I think we already are teaching it, uh, and they're in the pamphlet. I, I just mentioned some of them, but servant leadership, stewardship, energy management, the training compact that John just held up. Uh, I think all the Zing trained people know those things. So there's there's none of them are shocking to anybody who's been to Zinc Train or works at Zinc Train or most of the people who work in the ZCOB. But the training compact, which puts 100% responsibility on the trainee and 100% on the trainer right from the beginning, you're saying like, I can't make this happen by myself. So it's, it's, it's embedded, humility is embedded in that relationship from day one. So I, I think those are teaching it at a, at a uh, subsurface level. We haven't called it out. Beyond that, though, I realized uh, that we actually can expect humility because why do you have to just take a chance on getting it, right? We don't, we, 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 we expect like energy, positive energy is a performance expectation here at Zingerman's. I wrote about it in part two. I learned about it from Anise Kavanaugh. Her books are great. Uh, it's become an well integrated into our organizational culture and our systems is that you need to bring positive energy. We have a language around what to do when it doesn't happen. That wasn't a one day project, right? It took 10 years of working at it. Same with humility. So if we make humility part of the process, then I would say the same thing to, to somebody we hired. Hey, at home, you could be as egotistical as you want. It's none of my business. Good stuff. As far as but when you're at work, this is part of the job. So we have a new statement of beliefs that we're uh, just starting to roll out and we're working on getting it printed so people uh, who are on here, et cetera, can buy it uh, and learn from it. But it's basically a 30 pages. I don't know. It's pretty extensive. But one of the beliefs in there is that we believe that humility, I don't remember the exact word, but that humility works better. So we're going to actually put it in there and then it becomes an expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have a chart in here about how to hire for humility. It's on page 38. Uh, tell me about the most important accomplishments of your career. Uh, what was the most embarrassing moment of your career? I love that one, by the way. Let's, let's yeah, those are those are from Patrick Lencioni, to be clear. Yeah. So, good stuff. And that's there are Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. Yeah, just I mean, by asking people, where did you where did you go wrong? What's a project that you led that didn't work? What would you do differently now? Uh, I like to ask what's, what's the best compliment you got? Somebody taught me that years ago because hmm. it tells me a lot about what jazzes them up, right? So if the best compliment was from the CEO of General Electric, it, it's not bad, but if the best compliment came from their five-year-old or the best compliment came from a new staff member or the best compliment came from somebody who quit their company unhappy but 10 years later had a good relationship with them, like all of those are telling you that there's humility uh, in that, in that person. Good stuff. I see some here, Emily, but do you have some uh, favorite questions off the top? Yeah. Well, you mentioned beliefs, Ari. And uh, yes, I did. Um, Nicholas had a great question about how do you tie being humble into the belief cycle? Yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. I mean, all of this, I'm still learning. Too. I'm still learning too. I'm sorry. Explain the belief cycle a little bit. Yeah. Here. Okay. So the belief cycle. So, uh, I learned it from Bob and Judith Wright from their book, Transform, which Emily or Mara or somebody's going to throw in the chat in under 60 seconds, probably. Uh, I know Bob Wright. It's a long story. If you want to read it, it's in the end notes of part three. And then he wrote the foreword for part three. But anyway, I was about whatever, halfway through their book. And I stumbled on this visual of a self-fulfilling belief cycle, uh, which blew my mind because it gave me insight to understand why this 
whatever, six, eight, 10 month problem I'd been struggling with organizationally that I was getting really frustrated with and I couldn't figure out the answer to this cycle showed me what was going on, which is in essence, the people on the project did not believe in the work and they didn't believe in each other. And it's self-fulfilling. If you don't believe in the work, you'll never do good work. And if you don't believe in the colleagues with whom you're working, whether it's teammates on the hockey team or in a business, it's still not going to go well because you're going to do things that even if you don't realize you're doing it are going to make them look bad. Right. So uh, it kind of blew my mind. It was super helpful in the moment, but then I just started to read more and more and like humility only even bigger. I realized it was really everywhere. Right. So there's beliefs about beards. There's beliefs about human beings. There's beliefs at super small scale about like what's appropriate dress to wear to work or beliefs about anarchists that are inaccurate. Uh, but then there's also big beliefs like racism, beliefs that women can't lead, beliefs that young people aren't interested in working hard. I mean, all of this stuff that are sort of socially accepted nor or norms or have been or are in many places that are very destructive. And then I realized it was going on in our whole organization. If the manager doesn't believe in the employee that reports to them, it's not going to go well. If the employee doesn't believe in the manager, it's not going to go well. Right. The player has to believe in the coach. Uh, if the if if the staff member doesn't believe the product's good, they're not going to sell it. If et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is going on all day long. So of course, I did the only thing history majors really uh, know well, which is study. And so then I just started reading, 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 and I kept blowing my mind every time I read more. I learned more, and it turned into a 600-page book. So the the cycle is in there, but in essence, it's self-fulfilling. Uh, it says that we all have a lot of beliefs about everything whether what a good cup of coffee is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Based on our beliefs, we take action. If you believe that good coffee is worth the money, you ha happily go buy it. Your action starts to, to impact the beliefs of the people around you. So your friends might question their beliefs about coffee. The business that's selling you the coffee is reinforced in their belief that quality will sell, et cetera. Then they take action which is either to keep selling better coffee and feel more confident in their selling skills because you bought it, they like it, you, they feel good, and your friends start buying it too, which reinforces the cycle that good coffee's good, and it reinforces our original belief. So the whole thing is basically a loop that we're almost all going in almost all the time, whether we realize it or not. Uh, humility is part of that because it starts with a self-belief. Right, so some of the myths that John referenced that are in the pamphlet, Etc. And then I, I, I'm not a psychologist, but it seems fairly clear that most of these issues around humility and ego or low self image, which is, as John pointed out, not humility, <clears throat> these are all coming from our childhood. I mean, and I don't need to restudy every person we hire or my own. Well, I have studied my own, but I don't need to restudy every person that we hire's childhood history, really, only to help them understand that they're, they're, what happened to them at two is going to have an impact on them at 22 and 42. Or 56, it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> well, for the rest of our lives, I mean, I, Ram Dass, uh, who I thought when I first started reading about him was this mystical Indian guy, but turned out to be a Jewish psychologist from New York, but still is <laughs> awesome. Uh, and I went to hear him speak when I was struggling with a lot of stuff. He spoke at the power center. I remember. And, uh, I don't know, he's probably as old as I am now at the time. But anyway, he, he said, you know, I still have all the same problems I had when I was 20. He said, it's just that when I was 20, they were overwhelming, like tidal waves dominating my life. He said, now they're like gentle flies buzzing around my head, and I just sort of gently push them away. But it's the same problem. So I, I think we all will continue to have the same issues. I will. But it's just that we've learned to manage them better without thrash. You know, when you see your your kid, I mean, some small thing happens and he freaks out, right? You and I want to freak out. No, well, you and I still want to freak out. We just have learned how to not do it. Yeah. We also learned that it's counterproductive. It's it's not going to get you the thing that you want. Um, yeah. At that early stage, you don't know that, of course. So, no, Teddy is a bundle of impulses and you see what that's all about. So, so yeah, so humility, to answer the question directly, really succinctly, Humility, I would suggest, is embedded in our self-beliefs from the time we're little kids, and then how that manifests going forward is up to us. Mm -hmm. Very good. Also, by the way, about humility, credit, and so on, I can tell you from coaching, from teaching, the second you take credit for your players' work or your students' work or your employees' work, it's the second they quit working for you. 
All right. Why would I want to work for somebody who takes the credit for what I do? It, it's we're all sensitive to it. And I find the current generation is more sensitive to it. We don't expect the world to be fair, Ari. They do. Um, and so that's a, what I pointed out. I didn't score a single goal as a hockey player. I didn't score a single goal as a coach. It's all you guys. And that's not false humility. I got a stat sheet. Proves it. All right. All sandwiches are served by other people at Zingerman's pretty much. So you got a yep. stat sheet right there. So yep. um, we have time for one or two more questions here. Emily, what do you got? Yeah, we've got a couple more um, specifically around anarchism. Okay. Um, <laughs> which I think you maybe know something about. Uh, do you have a recommendation, Ari, for um, a first stop or a favorite book for someone looking to dig into the anarchistic way of thinking? Well, in humility, I'm going to just send them to what I wrote because then you're going to get my version of it. Uh, and then in the back of the books, there's a reading list with all the other stuff that I like. But uh, I would, there's three uh, pamphlets if you don't want a whole book, uh, but Secret uh, 29 is in part two. It's all about anarchisms and its application to business. Uh, Secret 43.5 is in part four, and that's also uh, in, uh, in uh, thank you, Jenny, it's on a PDF, it's true. Uh, if you wanna read it immediately, it's, that's in part four, and then the new uh, pamphlet from a year ago about Emma Goldman has more of that in there too. So those three, are really my application. There is no like perfect anarchist thing. That's like, it's true of anything. And it's definitely by definition true of anarchism. A lot of what made me think about anarchism in this context is just that because it's a non-hierarchical view of the world, it's already, if it's done well, has humility embedded in it, right? Whereas so much thinking in the world is hierarchical that it's, it's blocking out the humility. Whereas this comes from a place of humility and it, I, I wrote, I mean, we don't need to get into it now but it got me reflecting on the whole issue around the statues and the question was not should the particular ones come down that's one question but the bigger question for me is why do we even have people on statues in the first place and that's actually a message that does not reinforce humility uh you put a man on a statue a woman a statue you're asking for trouble, as the last few years have proven, by the way. So Yeah. Well, when I wrote in the pamphlet, I realized uh, in the writing work, which John, you'll relate, but if you take the E out of statues, you get status. And I'm sure uh, it's related in the Latin, but why don't we just not have them? Mm -hmm. I like it. Let's close by the little story at the end about the James Beard plaque. Yeah. If your customers, when your guests, yep. it's in the second floor, of course, of the Gally next door. Yep. Yep. So I actually forget that it's up there. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, awards are nice because it helps the people who work here feel better. I don't really care about them. Uh, and I, I, I don't mean that it's irrelevant in the same way that, you know, when I get a nice email from somebody, it's super relevant, but it's not that big a deal. Like it doesn't make you any better if you get it and it doesn't make you any worse. And in sports, you know, whatever, they, they really did win the championship. There is a competition, there's a game, et cetera. But when they give you an Oscar, or they give you a James Beard order, it's just a, let's face it, it's just a committee of people like you and me trying to figure out the right thing to do. I mean, there's no statistical thing that compares every restaurant in the country and comes out with this, or there's no thing that compares every writer in the country and comes out with who the award winner is. So I'm not being disrespectful to the people who do that work, but anyway, it does, it's nice, but it doesn't matter. So when I got, I, I don't even know what I meant. I meant some James Beard thing. And, you know, I gave the plaque to the deli marketing people and it went upstairs in the next door, which like you'd have, I don't even remember which room it's in. You'd have to really look for it. I had forgotten it's there. And this guy had come to uh, the annual tasting that we do at the holidays this year, I guess we'll be doing them on Zoom. Anyway, at the end he was buying some stuff and I think he bought some books and I signed some books and then he, he said, hey, you got time for a story? Like, of course, I want to hear a good story. So uh, he goes, yeah, you know, like I, I, when I was in school here, I used to go upstairs next door and I would study and I saw this kind of weird bronzy plaque thing on the wall. And, you know, I didn't really know what it was, but I, I happened to notice it and I didn't really pay much attention to it. He goes, whatever, two, three years later, I moved to Washington, D.C. and I, I get invited to this really fancy restaurant. We come in and behind the host stand is the exact same bronze plaque. They got like spotlights on it and and he goes, then I looked a lot closer and I realized what it was. And he goes, that story told me everything I really needed to know about the, the two businesses. 
and he's, he said, and I quoted him in the pamphlet, and I'm not looking at it, but basically he said, you take your work seriously, but you don't take yourself seriously. And I thought that was a really nice way to say it. Again, uh, humility is not mediocrity. It's not laissez-faire. It's not, I'm not, you know, I'm not much. It's that the plaque does not matter. Um, yeah. That the work matters. The work matters, yeah. So, Absolutely. On that note, I believe, Emily, we are at the noon hour. We sure are at the noon hour. Yeah, thank you, John, so much, and Ari both for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for submitting great questions. We have a ton of questions. Really? Actually, we weren't able to get to, so we'll be sure to get those fielded to Ari and to John. Um, I can get back to you with answers. Mara, I'm going to ask if Mara could drop a link to the pamphlet uh, in the chat for everyone again, just to have it. And um, all, all of our um, pamphlets, books, all that is currently 25% off on zingtrain.com using the code community2020. So um, we'll be sure to get that in the chat and in the follow up to you in the days to come with the recording. Um, I think that's kind of all of it here as far as housekeeping goes. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send those along to us at zingtrain at zingermans.com. I know Ari, you also um, would be happy to answer questions. Yeah, so my email, I, probably everybody on here has it already, but it's ari at zingermans.com. And Mara, I think you threw the e-news in there uh, link, but that way people could get uh, more info on a regular basis. So, And actually last week's e-news uh, which is on the zingermanscommunity.com site under archive, uh, had another piece about humility too. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. All right, thank all of you. Thanks John, nice working with you. Sorry. <laughs> Talk to you soon. You got it. Thanks everybody.